Hello everyone. Have you ever seen copper water bottles and copper utensils being used in your homes? Not only now, even in ancient times, copper has been used for storing food and water. And nowadays, even water purifiers which are lined with copper are coming in the market. So have you ever wondered why such a sudden interest in copper for storing food and water? Well, this is because copper has effective antibacterial properties. And according to a study, copper and mixture of copper containing alloys which have 99% copper are effective in killing a bacteria called E. coli. And let me tell you this, this E. coli bacteria produces toxins which can cause diarrhea, severe aches and nausea in infected people. So next time when you drink water, it is always better to drink it from a copper water bottle. Not only this, even copper as a metal has very high conductivity value of 5.96 into 10 raised to the power 7 Siemens per meter. And because of this high conductivity value, copper is extensively used in electrical wires. Now I would like to remind you of games. Yes, I am talking about games. Have you ever noticed in these games, the person who stands third receives a bronze medal? Did you ever think what this bronze medal is made up of? Actually, this bronze medal is mainly made up of copper with small amounts of tin. So, all these extensive applications of copper make one thing clear. And that is, it is very important to learn how to extract copper from its ores. Now, copper is present in the earth's crust in the form of its ores which mainly are copper pyrite, copper glens, cuprite and malachite. However, the principal or the most common ore of copper is copper pyrite. And we will learn the extraction of copper only from copper pyrite in today's class. Actually, a small part of this extraction process you have already learned in previous classes. But still, let me remind you. Copper, when it is first mined from the earth's crust in the form of its ore, is powdered and crushed and is concentrated by the process of froth flotation. Now, in the process of froth flotation, copper containing ore rises to the surface in the form of froth and the impurities or gang particles settle at the bottom of the tank. This froth can be skimmed off and pure copper ore can be recovered. Now, if you carefully observe this ore copper pyrite, you will notice that it is a sulphide ore. Therefore, from our previous knowledge, we know that sulphide ores have to be converted into their oxides because it is easier to reduce oxides as compared to sulphides. Now here, a natural question arises and that is, why is it easier to reduce oxides as compared to sulphides? Well, let me answer that question. Now, carbon is the most extensively used reducing agent for reducing metal oxides. And if carbon were to reduce a metal oxide MO, it will react with this MO to form free metal and carbon monoxide. And we all know that this reaction can occur in two steps, where in the first step, the metal oxide decomposes to give free metal and oxygen. And in the second step, this oxygen reacts with carbon to form carbon monoxide. Now, to answer this question in detail, we have to bring back the Ellingham diagrams. And in these Ellingham diagrams, I want all of you to focus your attention to carbon to carbon monoxide line. You will notice that this carbon to carbon monoxide line slopes downwards with a steep negative slope. And in this process of sloping downwards, it crosses many metal oxide lines. And according to a basic principle of Ellingham diagrams, the line which lies low in the Ellingham diagram is capable of reducing all metal oxides lying above it. Therefore, carbon is a very good reducing agent for most of the metal oxides. Now, suppose we have to directly reduce a metal sulphide with carbon. Then the equation of reduction would look like this. Here, the metal sulphide reacts with carbon to give free metal plus CS. And this reaction can also be thought to occur in two steps, where in the first step, the metal sulphide decomposes to give free metal and sulphur. And in the second step, this sulphur reacts with carbon to form CS. Now here, there is a problem. The problem is there is no compound like CS existing in nature. So suppose if we were to plot graphs for conversion of metal to metal sulphides like this, in this graph or Ellingham diagrams for formation of sulphides, you will notice that there is no line for the conversion of C to CS. 
and because there is no line for conversion of C to CS similar to the conversion of C to CO, which has a steep negative slope, carbon is a very poor reducing agent for sulfides. Therefore, most of the sulfides are first converted into their oxide and then the reduction is carried out. And it is easier to reduce metal sulfides in the form of their metal oxides. Now, quite obviously, in the next step of extraction of copper from copper pyrite is to convert this sulfide ore into its oxide by the process of roasting. So now the concentrated ore, which is concentrated by the process of froth flotation, is fed into a reverberatory furnace and heated under a blast of hot air and flames. We have already talked about this reverberatory furnace in our previous classes. Now, in this process, impurities like sulfur, arsenic and antimony react with oxygen to form their oxides which are volatile and escape from the mouth of the furnace. Now, the main reaction occurring in this process is where the copper pyrite reacts with oxygen to form cuprous sulfide, ferrous sulfide and sulfur dioxide. However, do you remember what our aim was? Our aim was to convert this sulfide ore into its oxide, right? However, here we end up with again cuprous sulfide and ferrous sulfide. But don't worry, small amounts of cuprous sulfide and ferrous sulfide do react with oxygen to convert into their respective oxides. But these are just minor reactions. The major reaction is where copper pyrite reacts with oxygen to form cuprous sulfide and ferrous sulfide. So copper is mainly present in the form of its sulfide even after this step. Now, after this process of roasting, we are majorly left with cuprous sulfide ferrous sulfide and small amounts of ferrous oxide and cuprous oxide. Now this mixture is mixed with sand or silica which acts as flux along with coke and fed into a blast furnace. Now this blast furnace is quite similar to the blast furnace which was used in the extraction of iron and about which we have already studied in our previous classes. Now in this blast furnace, this mixture is heated under a blast of hot air and many reactions occur in this blast furnace. Majorly and quite obviously first, the cuprous sulfide and ferrous sulfide react with oxygen in order to convert into cuprous oxide and ferrous oxide. And we all know that this ferrous oxide is basic impurity and can be removed by reacting with a silica flux which reacts with ferrous oxide to form ferrous silicate slag which flows to the bottom of the furnace. Now here I would like to highlight an important point and that is here, coke just not burns and acts as a fuel to produce heat, but also it prevents the reoxidation of ferrous oxide to Fe2O3 by reducing it back to ferrous oxide. And why do we need to keep iron in the form of ferrous oxide? Well, quite obviously because it is only ferrous oxide which reacts with acidic silicon dioxide flux to form ferrous silicate slag and can be removed easily. Otherwise, it is very difficult to remove iron as an impurity. Now, at this point, all of you must be thinking that we have achieved our goal of converting cuprous sulfide to cuprous oxide, right? But surprisingly here, a side reaction occurs, where the cuprous oxide again reacts with ferrous sulfide to convert back into cuprous sulfide and ferrous oxide. So now we reach at the same point in our journey from where we started this journey, right? Now, do you know why this reaction actually occurs in the first place? Well, to answer this question, we have to discuss a principle which is called hard soft acid base principle. According to this principle, a hard acid has more affinity for a hard base and prefers to form a compound with it. Similarly, a soft acid has more affinity for soft base and prefers to form compound with it. So now if you were to analyze the left hand side of this equation, you will find that in cuprous oxide, Copper is present as cuprous cation and oxygen is present as oxide anion. This cuprous cation is a soft acid and the oxide anion is a hard base. Similarly, in ferrous sulfide, ferrous cation acts as a borderline acid and sulfide anion acts as a soft base. Therefore, quite obviously and clearly, the soft cuprous cation has more affinity for the soft sulfide anion and this drives this reaction forward leading to the formation of cuprous sulfide. So now again we need to convert this cuprous sulfide back into its oxide. Now after this process we are left with majorly cuprous sulfide with small amounts of ferrous sulfide. 
and this mixture of cuprous sulfide and ferrous sulfide is given a special name which is copper mat. Due to high temperatures in the furnace, this copper mat melts and collects at the bottom of the furnace. And as we all know, the ferrous silicate slag is insoluble in this copper mat and is less dense than copper mat. Therefore, it floats on top of a copper mat and can be easily separated. Therefore, now this copper mat is collected. Now, the copper mat obtained from blast furnace undergoes a process called bessemerization in a vessel called bessemer converter. Basically, a bessemer converter is a pear-shaped vessel made up of steel from outside and from inside lined with fireproof bricks. This bessemer converter is narrow at the top and widens out at the bottom. This bessemer converter is fixed horizontally around its horizontal axis and can be tilted in either directions. From the bottom of the furnace, hot air is blown in with the help of pipes which are called two ears. Now, copper mat is introduced into this bessemer converter by keeping it in an upright position and this copper mat falls onto the bottom of the furnace. Now, from the bottom of the furnace, hot air mixed with sand or silica, which obviously acts as flux, is blown in. With increase in temperature, any leftover impurities of sulfur, arsenic and antimony react with oxygen from the hot air blast to convert into their volatile oxides and these volatile oxide escape as gases from the top of the furnace. Now, quite obviously, the leftover ferrous sulfide reacts with oxygen from the blast of hot air to convert into ferrous oxide. And this basic ferrous oxide again reacts with acidic flux silicon dioxide to form ferrous silicate slag, which then flows to the bottom of the furnace. After most of the ferrous sulfide is consumed as ferrous silicate slag, Cuprous sulfide also reacts with oxygen to convert into cuprous oxide and sulfur dioxide gas. Now, at this point, the most important reaction of this complete process occurs, where cuprous oxide reacts with cuprous sulfide in a self-reduction reaction, leading to the formation of pure copper and releasing sulfur dioxide gas. Now, I would like to highlight this last reaction where only compounds of copper react with each other and reduce each other, releasing pure copper and sulfur dioxide gas. And it is because of this reaction, there is no need to add any external reducing agent into this reaction. Now, let me bring out another important point about this extraction of copper. Have a careful look at this equation where copper metal is formed. Did you notice that along with copper metal here, sulfur dioxide gas is also formed? And this sulfur dioxide gas gets trapped in molten metal that collects at the bottom of the converter. Next, this converter is tilted and molten copper flows out. And quite obviously, the temperature outside converter is less than the temperature inside of the converter. Because it is way cooler outside, right? And because it is cooler outside, this molten copper tries to solidify. And as this molten copper solidifies, sulfur dioxide gas escapes from the surface of this molten copper. And as the sulfur dioxide gas escapes, it leaves behind small bubbles or blisters on the surface of this solid copper. In fact, this solid copper looks somewhat like this. And exactly because of its blistered appearance, this solid copper is called blister copper. In fact, this blister copper is 98% pure along with 2% impurities. So, in today's class, we learned how to extract copper from its ore. And we did this extraction by heating copper ore in a reverberatory furnace, followed by a blast furnace and finally in a bessemer converter. In the next class, we will apply similar principles of extraction to the extraction of zinc from its ore. But before we do that, let's do a quick recap of what we have learned today. Copper is present in the Earth's crust as its ores, namely copper glands, copper pyrite, cuprite and malachite. The principal or most common ore of copper is copper pyrite. When the ore is extracted from the Earth's crust, it is crushed and concentrated by the method of froth flotation. Here, the froth containing copper is separated from gang impurities. The concentrated ore now is roasted with a blast of hot air and flames in a reverberatory furnace. Next, a mixture of cuprous sulfide, ferrous sulfide, cuprous oxide and ferrous oxide 
is mixed with coke and sand and is heated with a blast of hot air in a blast furnace similar to that used in smelting of iron. Copper matte obtained from the blast furnace is then introduced into a Bessemer converter. A blast of hot air mixed with sand or silica as flux is blown into the furnace with the help of pipes called two years from the furnace bottom. Here copper and iron sulphides are converted into their oxides. Also cuprous oxide reacts with cuprous sulphide in a self-reduction reaction to give pure copper. As copper solidifies, sulphur dioxide gas released from the copper gives it a blistered appearance so this copper is called blister copper. Blister copper has 98% copper with 2% impurities. And finally, here is a quick flowchart of the extraction of copper that we have studied in this class.